Welcome back, Time Crunch fans. I'm your host, Coach Adam Pulford. I'm here once again with CTS Coach Kelly Moylan to help us apply what we learned about how to build strength and power as an athlete and apply it to the pedals as a cyclist. Kelly, welcome back. Hey. Well, last week we mentioned velocity-based training. And from a very high level, we described that it's essentially talking about and applying speed of movement to an exercise in the gym. And the reason why we want to do that is because if we want to be fast, we have to train fast. There needs to be some sort of uh, speed component into the weight that we're moving in order to get the result out of the exercise that we want. Would you agree with that? I would. Yeah. Okay. So when, when we're doing this, like when you're doing this at a competitive level, you've got a velocity based training system that attaches to a weight, you do the movement and you can track the speed of the movement, right? Yes. When you're coaching people. <laughs> yeah. Let's see it. Yeah. So if we have any, like, exactly. If we have any like super big nerds, well, there may be some people that are using this right now because it is, you can buy it online. I'll link to it for anybody who is curious about it. But our point is <laughs> we are not sponsored by these devices, nor is my point for anyone to go out there and, and, and buy one. Really the point I want to drive across and what, what Kelly and I are trying to get at here is start to think about the speed of movement. And let's just think of it as fast, medium, or slow. So when I'm working with athletes and I'm telling them to do a, a back squat, which we'll get into the example here, I, I will change the speed of movement from fast or medium, or let's go slow. Sometimes I, I do that. Um, so with this velocity based, um, system, it's not only trying to quantify, uh, the intensity based on perceived effort or one rep max or whatever we want to do, but also the speed of movement. Kelly, do you want to add anything to that in, in the way of what athletes should take away from our conversation here? Yeah, I, I think, you know, don't get too carried away with the speed at first. I, you've got to know that you're doing the movement properly. You've got to know that you're keeping a neutral spine when you're doing any a front squat or a back squat or a deadlift. Some people don't know how to bend over without bending at the spine, and it takes them years to learn it sometimes. So don't get too carried away with the speed. This is something we're we're trying to go, we're trying to push forward to a point of what matters in cycling. And how do you actually how do you actually create that power? And I think in, in the long run, if you keep showing up at the gym and you keep doing your work, you're going to you're going to accelerate and you're going to do better. So the speed part is a thing for knowledge so that you don't overload yourself, mainly in my book. Yes. Well, thank you, Kelly, for keeping me as well as everyone grounded in that, because I think keeping it simple um, is, is the approach, right? And in the previous podcast, I shared an example of when I was first learning some of the weightlifting, uh, movements, there were, there was months where I didn't even add load. My, my strength coach I was working with wouldn't allow our group to add load until we got that position down, then worked on the speed. Then we could, then we could add load. So in the previous podcast, you said strength is strength, no matter what type of athlete you're working with. So what I would like to do is run through some examples. I want you to tell our audience how you would approach working with a very beginner athlete. Say they've been riding their bike for a year or two and they learned about strength training and they want to learn how to get fast. They want to learn how to apply power to the pedals. Tell us where you'd start. And we all know spoiler alert, that you're going to start with good form, but let's use the back squat as an example for that and walk us through your process. So I don't start with the back squat, actually. I would out, what I would do with a beginner, actually, um, is I I go right to the basics and I will throw a, um, a rage ball down on the floor and I'll, I'll actually have them start from the seated position and I want to see how they can stand. What's a rage ball? So it, it's, a, it's a big fat ball. It's a weighted ball. It's only eight pounds. And that would put you seated approximately, I don't know, 16 inches off the floor. And I'll have someone sit on it and see if they can actually stand because I want to see if they have full range of motion for me. This is assuming 
we're clear of injuries, okay? So I wanna see how they stand first before I actually have them squat. If they can stand up off of that flawlessly, then we'll, I'll take it away from them and then we'll start not with a back squat, but with a front squat. I might even start with a goblet kettlebell because it depends on how new they are. If they're a brand new athlete, I'll put a kettlebell in front of them and I'll start them there. That's the only place where I'll do a high rep squat is a kettlebell. Just real quick though, why, why would you say um, loading the front or having like a front squat or a goblet squat as the place to start with that? Way? I agree with you, but describe your, your rationale. If you teach an athlete how to rack a bar, you're going to do a couple of things for them. You're going to actually, you're going to create uh, mobility in their shoulders and teaching them how to do a front squat properly. The back squat is easier to load and it's easier to overload. And if I've got somebody moving properly on a front squat, the back squat comes easy after that. Very good distinction with that. Okay. So let's assume that they're a good mover uh, using the raid ball and you do a couple, um, and you're doing high rep, uh, goblet squats to just simply get in, uh, repetitions, correct? More like yeah. learning that the movement pattern. But a week, a week, maybe right. two weeks at most. So right. I can get them through that. And then we move on. Um, I also start with mobility. So we, we start a program, um, with activation of the muscles. I have a uh, you can maybe see the bands behind me there, but every every workout I do, and many of my athletes have gotten the crossover bands, so it's just an activation process for shoulders mainly. Um, and then we do a mobility. We don't stretch. We do mobility, dynamic sort of stretching, and then we get into our lifts. You said a couple weeks that you would focus on a little higher rep uh, movement patterns with a squatting movement, goblet squat, front squat, whatever. Um is the end goal to move toward a back squat or are you just simply focused on squatting up and down? Walk us through some of this, that everything that goes into good form. So once we get away from the goblet, the, the goblet squats, we're going into front squats. We start with a five rep right there because I don't want faulty movement patterns. So you go into the high rep beyond five, you're going to get faulty movement patterns over and over again. And you, then you have to correct that. So just stay with five. I will, if somebody's really bad actually, or can't, can't get it, I shouldn't say really bad, but just isn't getting it. I'll, I'll go with three. Give me three good reps. And that's where we stop. So it's just what, a learning thing. Sure. Yeah. I totally get it. What are some, so what are some cues that you would see in the athlete that would make you s stop? and say, let's go down to three. Like what, what would the movement pattern be that you're looking for to avoid? Dropping of the chest. So, um, you know, just a matter of the spine being neutral as it drop, as you drop and the dropping of the chest will make you have to just kind of distort yourself in order to stand up yeah. with a front yeah, squat. One, one Elbows up. It's, we're not going to get into how to do things, but that's just one of the things that we look for. And the reason I bring it up is because, I mean, that's a tricky, uh, you answered it perfectly, by the way. It's a tricky one because again, we're remote. We're, we're in separate locations, you and I, and most of your athletes that all the athletes I'm working with, <laughs> with are I separate too. locations, most of them for you, separate locations. So, um, tell us just like real quick, how you're doing this from afar. Do you use an app? Do you, do you FaceTime them? Um, like how are you getting this feedback of how they look? Yeah. I use the coach now app. I use it with my own coach. That's where I get my feedback from them as well. And I use it with my own athletes. The coach now app allows the athlete, I encourage any of you to do this, whether you're using an app or not video yourself, Yes, my point. video yourself and watch what you're doing. You can learn by just go to, go to Greg Everett's catalyst athletics training volume, training library, and you can learn how to do a front squat. He will tell you why you're doing it, how to do it. You'll see people doing it with proper form and you, and you will know how to do that. And you can compare your own self to that. So there are ways to do that. But with myself, I use the coaching now app. They upload the video. I get to watch their video and talk to them on this app and then let them know, let's do this. I can even draw diagrams on it. For those who are just like, whoa, this is completely new to me. I don't know what I'm doing in the gym. 
and you're, and you're looking for help. I mean, you can, you can reach out to, to Kelly. Uh, you can reach out to some of these resources that we're going, but just like watch really good. And, and we'll link to Kelly. We'll link to that in our show notes so that people can go and, and get good visual examples of what a squat looks like and in other movements too. How long are we spending on good form with a squat movement like this? It, generally speaking, I know it's very individualized, but when you're working with a new athlete, ongoing constant everything i do in the gym everything i do in the gym is about positions everything and i still to this day i'm working on my snatch position from below the knee to above the knee it's a hard thing because the heavier the weight gets the more you're going to pull forward so you have to you have to fight that and you have to understand there's so there's so many little things to understand about doing so it's why i love it actually because of the fact that you don't need heavy weights. You, you, you just need to know what you will learn about yourself and your abilities or your lack of and what you need to try and push for. You will be surprised. And it's it's really fun and empowering to um, to change yourself that way in a positive way. I would say the next question is, what do you see in an athlete or what are you looking for to cue you that now we need to work on speed or the velocity of the movement? If they're doing it comfortably and flawlessly and are, are willing to push, it's kind of hard to actually describe what that would look like. But, um, you know, if they're doing it well and they're willing to do it, I'm going to, I'm going to, you won't hurt by putting a velocity based unit on them just so they can see what that looks like and what that feels like and what they're capable of. Yeah. And I would say, I mean, just based on my experience, I mean, I, I would say it looks beautiful. It, it looks mm-hmm. smooth right? They, mm-hmm. they descend, then mm-hmm. they push up. And, and that whole uh, kinetic chain looks beautiful. And, and, and there's some art form that goes on in that. And people are like, Oh, how do I know that? Well, we'll give you examples to look at, but it's not herky jerky. It's not like swervy. There's not like mm-hmm. this, butt curling under, it looks beautiful. It looks like an athlete mm-hmm. doing a squat movement. And so also from that speed of movement, when it, let's just say from a squatting um, position or the squat exercise, when we're controlling the speed of movement, we're really talking about the concentric muscle action, right? The, the, the push yes. up, correct? Yes. And okay. a lot of times, even I'll do a pause at the bottom of a squat. Why do you do that? You don't have to lift as heavy. You know? mm-hmm. That is that in its own right is hard. So if I have, I do have one athlete that I'm doing that with now, and then she's doing it beautifully. She's, you know, in her fifties and she's, killing it actually. And, you know, I just see that and I'm just like, you know, I, I will take an athlete where they want to go and I can push them to a point that they want to be to. If they only want to stay in a certain range, then we, we play with that and we do the best we can with that. Agreed. And there's also some muscle control that goes on with a a pause in the middle or at the base of the squat and then coming back up. And then Mm -hmm. when you, when you change the velocity or try to increase the speed of it by going up, we now all of a sudden we're producing Mm -hmm. more force um, and getting a little bit more out of the muscle. So once, once you're moving, once you have a good position, you start to add some speed, the final piece is you add load. What mm-hmm. can you say there? Like, I don't know, how, how long would you expect a fairly beginner athlete that comes to you and starts working with you? But when would you start adding load with, with an athlete that's, uh, has good position and has added the speed component and they look beautiful? If I have an athlete who's who's moving well for me, they're not always going to go into the the perfect squat. They're not always going to do the perfect deadlift. And I'm I'm constantly correcting. I'm hands on. I want them to understand that. But my athletes are lifting heavier weights in the fourth week than they are the first week. All of them. All of them. It's so it's not like we're not loading them. It's just that RM thing, you know. Just understand what RM means. It's not go for broke. It doesn't mean uh, get it out there and go as hard as you can. It's just like training and endurance sports. You don't want to go in a one-minute power interval like it's a sprint. You want it to be a one-minute power interval. You know, you want to be able to hold that. So it's the same thing. You don't want to go all out like that all the time. So it's a building process. If they're if they're moving if they're moving well, we'll we'll load. You know, and there's just a point where we're going to keep playing with that. And, and then we go with speed and then we go with load. Yep. And, and it's forth. a, Back it's given, it's give and take. It's give yep. and take. Yeah. 
so the one thing I want to point out here is, especially with like a squatting movement, your the speed of movement or the the quality of movement, the, the beautifulness will become more beautiful if you add a little load as you go like that. And so it's it's good form first, speed, then load, then speed, then load as you kind of build up like that, because as the muscle gets a little bit stronger in your connections, get better to do the movement, adding that load will, will help you feel more coordinated. And I think it's important to realize that in your like adaptation process. Would you agree with that? Yes. And that's why when I build a program, I like build, I mainly build four week programs, but I will put it to four, five weeks sometimes because I want day one to always be day one. This is what you're going to do on this day it becomes familiar to this athlete. Don't keep changing them. Don't keep changing your exercises. Become familiar with these exercises. I only have three main lifts that I'll do with each athlete. A, it's time, right? It's B, it's something that you become familiar with and you're going to push yourself. I always say in the, in the first week, this is a base building week. Leave room in the tank. Leave room in the tank. Leave five, 10 pounds in the tank on your legs. Leave two to five pounds on your on your shoulders. And then week two, either repeat it or add a, add a pound or two pounds. Week three can be a recovery week, depending on what they're doing on the bike. If they're going heavy on the bike, I'm going lighter in the gym. If they're going lighter on the bike, it's, a, it's an opportunity to go heavier in the gym. You said you have three main movements that you do with athletes? Squatting. Hinging and pressing. The rest after the main lifts are done are accessory work. Accessory work being single leg deadlifts, right, right. Uh, pull ups, push ups, or you know, I'll, I'll usually do three accessory work. One being a trunk, meaning core, what people call it, trunk work, a, a push and a pull, or a single leg exercise, depending That's on what the athlete needs. Right. So squat, hinge, and pull. Uh, I, I think we got the concept of squat. Can you describe a hinge for us? Hinge being an RDL. Yeah. So total just hinging at the hip, hinging at the hip. And that can be a really difficult thing for athletes to learn if they've never done it. But don't be afraid of it. It can be learned. And it is really a good primal movement because most most endurance athletes lack posterior strength especially runners. Yeah. And without, without working your posterior chain, you, you know, you're never going to get that much better because you, you will realize I'm doing right now with my coach, um, RDLs at speed, which is a new thing for me because I'm not good at, at being really fast in my clean pull. He's trying to teach me and he's doing power cleans and speed on my RDLs at the rate that I'm doing it. I'm like, God, you know, it's really hard to do, but it's teaching me to think differently too. So with a pull then I think, I think everybody knows what that is, but give us a description of what a pull would be. A, pu a pull is a, is a clean pull um, with a clean gripping just outside of your, your thighs. And I teach all my athletes snatch grip pull. And us usually, not always, I am raising the floor for a snatch grip pull because I need to get that position, especially if they're tight in the posterior chain. It's a different grip. It's a different feel for standing up. And I'm just going to have them pull up standing up to the hip. I'm not going to have them actually shrug because it's a whole other piece of movement that they need to learn. That pulling movement that you're describing, that is, that's pretty specific to all the core weightlifting movements that, that we're talking about, correct? Yes. Plays right into it. And the, yep. and the push press as well. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And the push press. Yep. And then when you say raise the floor, what you're doing is you're essentially uh, stacking weights to raise that bar up so that the, the bar is a little bit closer to your hips so that you don't have to uh, move as much yeah. to get it correct that for our listeners that yeah. may not understand that yep. yeah you, you pile up the plates or if you have blocks like i do you can put the plates on blocks that are even it puts you in a position where you're more comfortable in the in, in the, down, the down bottom position so that when you stand up with the weight, it's it's a more comfortable position. You can strengthen in that range really well, actually, too. You don't need to always go from the floor. And once you strengthen that range, then I'll lower it and lighten the weight and strengthen in that range. So that's how we kind of build back down to a better, a better uh, range of motion there. So really for our listeners, I mean, th this is a very, I would say, very different podcast than what we've done in the past because we're really focused on the core movements that get you strong and make you fast. It's not bicep curls. 
it, it's not a leg press. I mean, th- these are other additional things that we can add on, but it's it's too fancy. What we're talking about is very simplistic things. You got three movements, you got three steps. So with a push then, um, you said push press, and that's going into uh, the, the weightlifting component too. I think I glossed over that one, but you saved me on it, correct? Yes, push press. I just like doing a strict push press um, with a bar. Yeah. just so they can learn that I will take that into a power and I'll teach them a power jerk. Most, most of my athletes are doing power jerks. They yeah. here's where the speed comes. Here's where the first speed comes is a, is in a, in a power jerk. They learn to move their body. They learn to push with their legs and they learn to pop a weight over their head and it, it works their entire trunk. So that's the first place where I really work on speed. And it's a full body. That's a full body speed movement there. Uh, so I, again, for our listeners, there, there may, there's probably a ton of you that haven't done any of these movements before. Okay. They're, they are fairly complex and they require technique. So listen to Kelly, watch the movement <laughs> patterns. And I would really encourage people to hire a strength coach to just start to learn the basics. If you're very, if you're curious about developing uh, powerful movement patterns using these techniques. Um, I, I like, I can't stress that enough. It's not that you can't self teach. You definitely can, but it'll go a long way to hire somebody who knows what they're doing. Absolutely. Every weightlifter I know has a coach and they are very well versed weightlifters. Actually. I, um, there aren't that many weightlifters out there that don't have coaches. So it's, it's it, having somebody with eyes on you is a really good thing. And it's a really helpful thing. And it's also, again, it will help you reach new phases that you haven't ever thought you could reach. Uh, strength training isn't just about building muscles and getting fast on the bike. I mean, it, it builds bone density. It's good for your brain. It, um, it's good for your memory. Even it's been shown to, it's been shown to help so many pieces of good health and longevity. So I would, I encourage everybody, no, no matter where you're at, and if you're going to a gym, keep going. I don't want to deter anybody from what they're already doing and say, you got to be doing it my way. I'm just trying to, what I'm trying to do, what we're trying to do is give you a, a methodical, systematic way that puts structure into a program that will help you integrate it into your cycling or your running. Let's talk about that yeah. real quick, and then we'll we'll um, bring this thing home, Kelly. Uh, let's, let's work through a weekly example, Monday through Sunday, let's say, and you can use one of your athletes that you're currently working with, but walk us through like when the rest days would come and if they're doing some tempo work on the bike, but they are continually working on this, uh, strength and power in the gym. Give us some example of Monday through Sunday, how that looks for their training program. Typically, Monday is always a rest day. It's just an easy day to have as a rest day, right? It's Monday. Yeah. So uh, if, I have, um, if I have an athlete that's doing an interval, two intervals a week, I'll do, again, it depends on the athlete a lot, okay? So, yeah, but- and it can lead into a real heated discussion of you shouldn't do that, but I, I will do what I'm doing with my athletes is they're actually doing lifting on Tuesday and doing a tempo workout on Wednesday. Sometimes I'll flip that. It's not written in stone. We will play with it. Depending on how the athlete feels, if they don't like that, guess what? We'll we'll do the lifting on Wednesday and the intervals on Tuesday. It doesn't need to be written so hard and, and in stone, but let's see how it feels and see how it works for you. You don't want to do intervals and lifting on the same day. I think you'll trash yourself doing that. It's really hard to do. It is hard to do, but... Uh, do you have any athletes that, that, that you encourage that? Um, so if you do, if you're so time crunched that the schedule lines up to where you have to have a, a double day, uh, do you have athletes doing that? I have a guy up in Iceland doing that actually. And he, he, yeah. he lifts, he lifts before he does intervals and, um, he loves it. Mm-hmm. He does a different type of training, though. He does a hypertrophy type of training. So he's a little bit different from what we've been talking about. So that's what he does, and that's what he likes, and that's what we do. And I, and I would say suss it out with, you know, does it work for you, does it not? Because I, I would say that the number one thing I try to stay away from is for any athlete, let alone a time-crunched athlete, to go hard all the time. And when we try to 
not lift on our interval days, I tend to find athletes lifting on their rest days or lifting on their recovery days. And I would personally, and you can, uh, you can totally disagree with me, but personally, I try to bring contrast in so that they recover better. And then we can focus on the intensity or the, you know, the hard days, essentially. You know, I think the recovery part too, I think it's okay to lift on an endurance day. I agree with that. If it's yeah, a recovery, if, it, if it's a recovery day, yes, it is a recovery day. And I don't put, I don't put that onto my athletes mm-hmm. or on the rest day. You know, sometimes on a rest day, they're going to lift because that's, that's the only place they can fit it in. And it's, it's not the end of the world there. You know, it doesn't have yeah. to, we could drive ourselves nuts with that stuff. I would rather they be in the gym than not be in the gym and, and get being on their bike when they need to be on their bike. If they're training for an Ironman, you know, and the time is just pushing them all over the place and their schedule is crazy. You know, it's just a matter sometimes of get it done. Yeah. I, I would totally agree with that. But, I, and, and so to that end, it is my opinion, completely okay to lift on the days where you got some intervals. It's also okay to lift on the days where you got endurance, keep your rest days as rest, keep your ease days easy. And that, that's my yes. general philosophy on that. So uh, yeah. let, let's go back to, uh, we got derailed on our weekly example. So Monday, we got a rest day. Okay. Tuesday, lift. Wednesday, tempo. Thursday, lift. Um, yeah, that's an endurance day. Endurance. Oh, endurance. That, not that'd be an day. endurance day. Okay. Yeah. It would be endurance and lifting. Yeah. I mean, you could do endurance being hour and a half, but you know, the time, whatever you you can do, but you can lift on that day. Friday is your recovery day. If you're doing three days a week, Saturday can be a lift day. Mm -hmm. And you know, I do, it depends again, here's where we depend on the athlete. You can do a tempo ride on that day. Make sure you warm up well, because you're probably going to be very tired on that day, depending on your recovery. And then if it just make tempo very aerobic, and I think you'll be fine. And then Sunday can be an endurance day. Cool. Again, there's a thing where you can play with that and see how the athlete feels. Very doable. And I would also say that may change, you know, if you change from tempo to threshold or tempo to VO2, the pattern may change yet again, depending on, mm-hmm. you know, availability and all that kind of stuff. But again, to our, to our audience though, I want to provide some of these examples of what we're doing as coaches that we find successful. And then they can play with that variability depending on how they feel, uh, how much sleep they got, (laughs) how much stress is at work and those types of things. Cause it all definitely, definitely plays into it. Yeah. I think too, um, Adam is, is mentioning how the four week plan goes and the, the way that I structure the four week strength plan on strength training on top of a four week training peaks plan week one is a base building week no matter what we're doing in the weight weight room week two is building week three can be a building it depends here on what you're doing with your training peaks plan because if you're recovering here you might want to go a little heavier here and then on the week four if you're going heavy in the on the bike you do your recovery back off week in the gym, back off, meaning deload, just go through the movements, 85% of what you did on week three. No, I love that. And I've done similar things in my coaching. And I think that at surface level, it may be a little counterintuitive where if we back, back off the gas on the bike, when we push the gas in the gym, but I think it's, it's, it's different because especially if we have athletes that are not doing 20 hour weeks, for example, you know, we're, we're less, you know, toward mm-hmm. time crunched, lower volume, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. as long as we're sleeping and eating. Okay. I take that opportunity of deloading from the bike and do a bit more in the gym. And I think because total volume is low, we can get away with that and continually to build because what we're trying to do, you know, load it back up on substrate and some of that more of that endurance capacity, let that recharge. But in the gym, it's like ones and zeros Our our total volume, you know, muscle gets fatigued or not. It doesn't really play with endurance. So yeah, that's a brilliant, um, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's a very good way of doing it. I think that's a good takeaway for a lot of listeners too. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you, you get there, through trial and error, right? Like you try it, see if it works for you. It, the stuff that we're talking about, it may not, there may be a, a slight variation where it does, but the seeds that we're giving you in the way of starting to think beyond just like, you know, eight to 12 repetitions on your bicep curl or on your hamstring curl, like start to get away from that 
if you want to develop good power for pedaling. Yes. Because those accessory lifts that we had talked about before, it's just not my go-to thing if you want performance. I like accessory for things like uh, glute bridging. Yeah. I do, you know, don't do a five minute plank, do a 30 second plank and throw a 10, 15 kilogram weight on your back. You know, oh, you do, yep. do some glute bridging, do some glute bridging and throw a bar on your hips. Do it so that it's successful and, and uh, effective for you. Kelly, I guess like with our core message of start to think differently about what you're doing in the gym, here are some movements that you can do that you can start to learn and into, incorporate into your training program. And then here's a ton of resources with the link to uh, Greg's website, as well as the articles that we talked about in the previous episode. I'll link to all of that in our show notes on both um, on on both episode landing pages. Uh, is there anything else that you want our audience to know on their journey of becoming a better athlete? And they're starting to like, man, this sounds pretty scary. I never even thought about like, lifting a bar over my head really fast. What else? Like, what can you say to that audience member? That's like, I don't know about this. Well, you know, it's not, a, we're not asking anybody to, to do anything that they're not capable of doing. First of all, there, you know, in most gyms, you go into a gym, you're going to find that it's a 20 kilogram bar. Do not do that. Um, look, ask them if they have a 10 kilogram bar, find out if they have um, even smaller than that. Some of them do. Some of them have smaller like little barbells that you can use. So play, play with what you can do. Remember it's, it's about leaving room in the tank and the movement first. Okay. So that is key. Start from where you are. Don't try to go where you used to be 20 years ago. Don't go into a gym and compete with anybody because people may have been there for years. Let a gym be a positive place for you and, and, and learn from other people. You might find, um, People are there that can help you as well, but hire a coach if you can. Yep. We're here. <laughs> that's, that's right. Uh, <laughs> we are, we are here. Um, I would say like in, in summary, I, I think the, probably the biggest thing for me is strength is strength, no matter what type of athlete you are, because we develop strength in the gym. And so long as you keep on pedaling your bike and doing other endurance things, that strength will follow with you. Okay. Uh, but you're not doing endurance stuff in the gym if you want to get powerful and strong. And that's my core message. And I think that's what Kelly has, has really extrapolated from everything that she shared with you today. And to, to your point, Kelly, we are here. If you want to learn more, Kelly, if, if people love what you said, I mean, are you taking on clients right now? Um, do you specialize just in weightlifting? Uh, like if they just want you as a weightlifting coach, do you do that as well as endurance stuff? Tell us a little bit more about that. I do. Um, I, I have people that I work with solely just with weightlifting. <clears throat> um, but most of the people that I work with are also endurance athletes as well that I work with. I am taking on clients. I have people that have come to me that are power lifters. I've had people that come to me that are bodybuilders and there's a, there's a, seems to always be a, a place where they can't mix their training with their bodybuilding or their, or their power lifting. And they, that's a place where we have to have a discussion on how to actually manipulate your overall training program so that it suits the power lifting, but also nurtures the endurance part of things do one rep at a time and keep showing up and keep showing up that's right yeah if there's if there's any secret which there's not any silver bullet but it, it is it's showing up and it's doing the movement over and over in, in a very good way a very good quality way like we like we described so uh kelly what's the best way for people to get in touch with you Oh, email's good. Um, I'm also on Instagram, Kelly Moylan. I've got a Facebook page, Kelly Moylan with CTS. Perfect. Okay. Well, we'll link to your email in our show notes. Uh, Kelly with an IE, by the way. Uh, well, great. Uh, Kelly, I will let you uh, get on with your day. Uh, I know you've, you're re trying to recover from a big lift already uh, this afternoon. So <laughs> thank you so much for taking time to join us on the Time Crunched Cyclist Podcast. My pleasure. Thank you.